Okay. So thank you all for coming. It's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces. And so we appreciate that you took some time out to join us today. Uh, our plan is for the next hour is that we just want to do a quick introduction to the, bio, the biological sciences department. And then we've invited three alumni to share a little bit about their work. And we'll have some time to have conversation with them and to ask questions. And then we thought it might be fun to break into some smaller groups and um, maybe have a chance to catch up with some old friends or faculty or um, just have some smaller group conversations. So um, my name is Jody Saylor and I'm the department chair currently and I've been here for 18 years now and I'm just so happy to, to see some familiar faces here today. So let's see, I will have the rest of the faculty um, introduce themselves and maybe we'll have our um, emeritus <laughs> faculty uh, introduce themselves first and then maybe we can just go by order that we arrived on campus. Is that good enough to say it that way you all? All right, so that means Stan you're up first. Oh, you're muted Stan. So, I, so I'm the elder in the group. <clears throat> um, I came in 75 as a faculty member. I came in uh, before that. I came as a 1W fellow at the Goshen College in, uh, in before, uh, I guess, 59. And finished that in 61 and started college because I didn't know what else to do. And then for the rest of the time until 08, I was privileged to be able to uh, teach in the biology department, uh, cellular, molecular, micro, human anatomy, physiology, uh, geology and conservation, or this, you get to teach a lot of things in, in those days. It was interesting. And I already talked about with Rishi about uh, the research group that we had. And that was quite stimulating. Nowadays, we're working with uh, Algae Town. That's an algae. The, like I said, the, the current faculty allows me to do this in my retirement. And it's been quite a stimulating thing. That's Greetings, everyone. My name is Ryan Sensenig. Um, I am an ecologist and mainly teach field ecology and field biology classes, including marine biology. And I believe I'm in my 13th year here at Goshen. It's good to welcome you all today. I think I'm next. Uh, my name is Andy Ammons. I've been at Goshen for 11 years now, and I'm an entomology, molecular genetics, um, and a class called Pollinators in Peril, uh, since my specialty is honeybees. Must be my turn. Is it my turn? Okay. I'm Neil. Uh, I came to Goshen in 1986 as a newborn baby, actually. So I came to Goshen College, and I'm, I'm an alumni too, uh, 2008. And this is just my third year teaching at Goshen College. So I do a little bit of work with uh, some cow lungs. My background is in pulmonary hypertension. And so we're trying to do some things comparing cow and yak lungs and their responses to. close to Goshen, so very convenient. Great, thank you all. So that's our faculty currently in teaching in the department. Um, we have some other part-time faculty that come from um, Mary Lee Environmental Center, and um, maybe mention a few things they're working on too. 
At this point, I'm going to share my uh, screen with you just to show you a few slides um, and some photos from campus. Oops. Okay, so this is our COVID edition here in uh, virtual, virtual homecoming. Um, and I thought you might be interested just to see how class looks a little bit different this, uh, this fall. So you can see our students are still working hard in the lab and in the field, um, wearing masks and keeping our distance. And it's been different, but a lot of good things are still happening and our students are just wonderful as always. So we've been enjoying um, the opportunity to at least be on campus together. Um, as a department, we've really been focusing recently on, um, on research for our students. And we just have always believed that um, you learn science best by doing science. And so we're trying to give our students as much opportunity as possible. So currently, all students in our department, um, they can complete one of three majors in biology, molecular biology, biochemistry, or environmental and marine science. And all of those students will do a senior thesis project and an internship before graduation. So students are doing research, some of them, um, in our department. And so each of the faculty has a project that they're working on. As Andy mentioned, he's working on honeybees and also some um, mosquito um, and the transmission of disease um, questions. As Stan already has mentioned, we have the Algae Town project going on that he helps to supervise. Um, my own research is looking at the microbiome in human breast milk. And we are starting to learn some interesting uh, patterns there. Ryan Sensenig uh, has projects both on campus and in Kenya, uh, looking at fire and grazing ecology. And uh, one of our part-time faculty members is working at Mary Lee also and um, is asking questions about uh, sustainable food production. And then Neil is working on his yaks and cows, looking at ion channels there. So those are some opportunities just briefly here on campus. We also have some summertime opportunities through the Maple Scholars Program. And so students apply for these positions and they get to work with a faculty mentor uh, during the summer. And the exciting part of this program, I think, is not, um, well, it's not just for science students. So um, faculty all over campus um, sponsor projects. And so our students are working in interdisciplinary kinds of groups, which is really great. So this past summer, we had two Maple Scholars in our department, Alexa Kennel, uh, who just finished her first year, and Bobby Sessa, who will be graduating this year. And you can see here their projects. We also have students who are going off campus um, for lots of exciting opportunities. Um, Kaylin Smith is getting ready to graduate this year, and she received an REU at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And uh, Jen Ritchie had an opportunity to work at AbbVie. Um, and she was able to do some work on COVID-19 this summer. Uh, these two students, you know, with everything that happened with the pandemic, were actually not able to be at the location working in the lab as they had anticipated when they got the positions. But they were able to do work and do some data analysis and collaboration through Zoom. So um, that was just its own interesting kind of experience for them. And then more, uh, Close by here at the University of Notre Dame, we had two students who are working at the Center for Civic Innovation, um, directing some projects that had um, applicability into the South Bend and Elkhart area. So those are just some examples of what our students have been up to. Uh, we continue to send a lot of students on to graduate school, medical school, dental school, and so here's just a list of some of the places where our students are currently. And just some stats if you are interested in that. Um, in the last five years, about 90% of our students who applied were accepted into medical school. 
we're having great success with our environmental um, students and we um, have a large number of students. I think about 30 are in this major currently. Um, and we rank second in Indiana for the most PhDs awarded to alumni. And that's for the entire um, GC campus, not just our department. Uh, last year, Goshen College was listed second um, in the best uh, undergraduate colleges. And I think this year we were ranked like fifth. And so um, we feel really good about the things that are happening on campus and the opportunities our students are having. And we're always uh, glad to connect with alumni like you uh, because you are a great resource. And if you are willing to host an intern, if you have career advice you'd like to share with our students, we'd be very happy to connect with you in that way. So I don't know if anybody has any questions at this point about um, things that are happening in the department. I know you are all anxious to hear from our uh, guests today. So, but I'd be glad to take any questions if you have them. Okay, well then I'd like to introduce first Brianne Brenneman and her dog. <laughs> Brianne uh, is a recent graduate of Goshen College and has just returned to campus this fall as a colleague. So we're very happy to have her back. And she's gonna tell us a little bit about the new public health program that she is directing. Thank you so much, Jody. Yeah, sorry, my dog, we keep our house pretty cold and so he's been looking for warmth from us today. <laughs> all he wants to do is sit on our laps. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, and I was just having a conversation actually with someone from IU who helps run the program, uh, the IU South Bend. And they said that their favorite students are Goshen College students because they come so prepared, they perform really well, and they are so like kind to each other and that really stood out to them. So I think that speaks a lot to um, all of you uh, working in the biology department. So Jody, am I able to share my screen on here? You might have to allow it. There we go. It's okay if I can't. There we go. Thank you, Jody. Okay, so I have a couple slides I'm going to work through. Um, so what is public health? I think quite often um, people get healthcare and public health confused. And in public health, we really care more about community and population level, as well as a lot of different factors that impact health. And I attended University of Michigan for my master's and I was in the Department of Health Behavior Health Education. And so I think that's why I'm so drawn to the social determinants of health and I talk to it a lot with my students, but it has actually helped, I think a lot of our students connect with public health because right now the two courses that are being taught this semester are Introduction to Public Health and Public Health policy and administration. And these are, uh, I think about five or six or seven declared public health majors already, but I have 21 students in introduction to public health and eight in public health policy. And so these classes are made up of students from kinesiology, history, nursing, public health, and then I have a lot of uh, biology students and biochem students. And so they are all going into different professions. And so it has been a joy to talk about the social determinants of health and show them that no matter whether they're going to be a doctor or a nurse or a physical therapist, or they want to be a community health worker, or they want to be a PE teacher. I have two students that are going to be PE teachers. Uh, that we can talk about the ways in which everything that they do impacts health outcomes on a population level. And I talk a lot about the social ecological model, which also helps the students connect. 
understanding if they're working at maybe a community level in a school that they are impacting health. If they talk to their friends about their health behaviors, they, they can use these relationships to, to build self-efficacy and to give people confidence in making really positive health choices in their lives. And so there are different majors. And so we're in the process of changing it a little bit. And I've showed that through some lines. So we are reducing the amount of chemistry needed. And that was due to scheduling conflicts, um, especially students that want to become a public health major maybe later in their college career, which we expect um, to happen. It, it allows students to become public health majors a little bit easier. Um, and then medical terminology has a lot of overlap. And the major is really made up of this core group of classes that you can see there. And with these classes, we talk a lot about inequality. We talk about racism. We talk about structural injustices. But then we also get into the nitty gritty of like, how is disease spread? What is the difference between communicable and non-communicable diseases? And right now, there's uh, it makes my job pretty easy. I don't have to look very far for information, especially about communicable diseases um, or about inequalities. We see that even with COVID-19. And so there's articles being written every single day, both in the scientific community and then also in mass media. And so I've been able to have them read these scientific articles and analyze them while also looking at stories from the Atlantic. Um, and students have been giving a lot of really positive feedback that they can use what we're learning in class to really apply to their everyday life. And we see people in public health probably doing some double majors or minors, and that's shown here. And one really exciting opportunity this year is the Global Health Virtual Practicum, which is a partnership between MCC and Goshen College. And I am not part of the, the group that is teaching it, um, but I am part of the advisory committee and it, it has been really fun to get to know Paul Shetler Fast, who is a Goshen grad, um, and he is really leading this. He works for MCC. And those students will be working together with people from seven different countries. So there's some Goshen college students and then some other people around the world that are involved with this course and it will run all year and it meets once a week on Saturday mornings. And then there's a public health Instagram, which I'm really excited about. Um, and it's been a fun way to connect with my students who use social media as one of their main sources of getting information. Um, and so, yeah, that's just been a fun way to connect with them. And Jody, I don't know if you want me to answer any questions now or if you want me to wait for later. Yeah, I think we can take, um, if you have a question or two now. Hey, uh, this is Rashika. <laughs> um, just, um, I'm really excited to hear about the public health major because we are trying to really learn how to incorporate diversity into our courses, um, especially with public health and uh, disease. And so I see a great partnership maybe in the future where we can maybe have you come and lecture, do a guest lecture for our, one of our classes so that we can um, learn a bit more about um, that area, so. That'd be great. Yeah. Good, thank you. Okay, well next we would like to hear from Bob Lurch and he is currently working at Pfizer and we're hoping he'll have some, I don't know, cool and helpful information today for us to understand a, uh, a little bit about the process of vaccine development and, and what kind of vaccine might be helpful in this current pandemic. Um, I'm an 84 grad. Um, actually, I had Stan for microbiology early on, um, both a uh, biology and chemistry graduate. And then I went on to get my PhD from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill um, in microbiology. And I focused on virology. Um, 
And right now, as Jody said, I work for uh, Pfizer. I work in the Vaccine R&D Research and Development Group. And so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing. Um, now, normally Pfizer, like most pharmaceutical companies, is, is very close to, holds things close to the, to the vest in terms of our science and our data. Um, but with the SARS-CoV-2 program, um, we've been routinely comp comp uh, data as soon as it becomes available. In fact, if you, uh, I'll mention about our, our phase three clinical trial in a little bit. Um, it is actually enrollment data, um, distribution data, clinical site information is actually available on our website um, for Pfizer.com, which is, which is really something unique, I think, for um, a pharmaceutical company to be putting things up as quickly as possible um, to let everybody know where things are at. So as I said, I'm in the vaccine R&D group, and so I'll talk about the vaccine program, but we also have antiviral compounds that are in development, including an uh, intravenous formulation that's going into the clinic either September or October. Um, it, it's a quirk of where, if you go way back when MERS and SARS um, came out, uh, we were developing an antiviral program, an antiviral candidate, and then everything disappeared. And so the program stopped. Um, and when SARS-CoV-2 came out, um, the, the company really went back and looked at the, the, pro, the, the candidates and their, the, the work that was done to see how we could bring that forward quickly. Um, from a vaccine perspective, um, we've been developing uh, an mRNA-based vaccine to SARS-CoV-2 in collaboration with a German biotech company, BioNTech. Um, and back in January, February, March, um, we were able to move quickly because we had an existing collaboration with BioNTech um, around um, a flu uh, possibility uh, vaccine. And the platform is a nucleic acid based platform technology. So as soon as the viral sequence was available for SARS-CoV-2, we could develop prototype vaccines. Um, the vaccines are actually a lipid nanoparticle composition with an mRNA that codes, in, in the case for SARS-CoV-2, the spike protein. So virology, a little bit of background, the spike protein is on the surface of the virus and it's how it gets into the cells. Um, and a key thing that happens is there's a conformational change in the spike protein as part of a fusion process between the viral membrane and the host cell membrane. And evidence in a lot of other um, similar type of viruses that have fusion pro, uh, proteins, for example, respiratory syncytial virus, which we have a, a program to, suggests that um, the, you get a better or more effective immune response when that is directed to a pre-fusion form of, this, of the protein as opposed to a post-fusion form. And so um, our top candidate, which has the spike protein coding sequence, actually has a modification that keeps the fusion protein in its pre-fusion conformation. So driving the immune response to a pre-fusion form as opposed to a post-fusion form. So um, early on in April, uh, very quickly, and, and, and everything was, was very quickly moved, um, as quick as possible, keeping in mind safety and uh, in mind safety in many places, just overlapping processes that normally we would spread out over, over years. Um, the phase one started in April and it included approximately 40 to 50 subjects and it compared four variations of the vaccine. Normally we wouldn't go into a phase one with so many different sort of possibilities, but because we'd work through in animals, um, which was our prime candidate. But um, working with the FDA and regulatory agencies, we felt we'd go in with a couple of different uh, candidates, a couple of different doses to try and get to what would be a, a good, the best candidate. And, and based on all that information, we selected one to go forward and worked through with, with regulatory agencies. What does that look like? Normally you go from a phase one, there are dose escalations. So you start at low dose and go forward. You then go into a phase two, which is more about, um, again, continuing safety to say it's safe in, in population that you don't have um, immune responses or actually more that you don't have um, side effects. Um, and then, you go into phase three, with, with, which is an efficacy. Now, what we are currently in is a what's called a high. 
Um, we dosed our first patient in July 27th, actually on July 27th, which, which means in less than six months, we went from a candidate to phase two, three efficacy study, um, which is normally a five-year process. Um, all along the way, keeping very close track of all of the processes that are going on. Um, and some of it's just overlapping and taking more company risk, I think is what I would say. Um, we're doing things at risk where we would not normally, we would normally wait to see an outcome before we'd move forward with preliminary manufacturing, with working on, on development and, and deciding what the final, final formulation is. Because if it, if it fails, you're investing a lot of money um, to get there. And so you want to know the, those things early on and, and drop things early on as in the process. Um, in this case, we're running ahead, even if it means that in the end we spend, um, by the end of the year, we'll have spent $2, $2 billion to develop the vaccine. And so if it doesn't work, Pfizer's out $2 billion. Um, we actually haven't taken any um, government funding. It's all self-funded from Pfizer. So as I said, the efficacy study actually started on the 27th of July. And as of Monday of this, this past week, over 35,000 people had been enrolled. And actually, you can follow the number on the website. Um, and that's out of a total projected of 44,000. The study is actually a placebo-controlled two-dose vaccination study where the, the candidates or the subjects will get a vaccination at day zero. So they actually come in, we screen them for COVID, and we vaccinate them. So we don't know actually if they're positive for COVID until the next day or two days later, but we, they get a vaccination either way because there's not, if we, if we, it takes two days, if you brought somebody in, said they were negative and then brought them back two days later to vaccinate them, they may be positive. Um, and so we're vaccinating at day zero, whether they're positive or negative. They then come back um, in three weeks at day 20, approximately day 21, and get a second vaccination. And then they're monitored for SARS-CoV-2 illness starting at day 28. Um, the guy who's doing the clinical testing group, actually I was talking with him a couple of weeks ago and he commented on they do have one patient where they know that the person has been po was positive day zero, positive day 21. Um, and so, you know, how that will impact the results um, will be an interesting discussion. The study um, continues. It's actually a two-year study. Even though you hear everything about, and politics aside, about you know, when the vaccine's gonna come out, um, this is a two-year ongoing safety and immune response study. So we have um, blood, blood draws out through at one year and at two years in, in the patients in the study to look at the immune response. Um, as, as has been published and in, in, in talked about in the media, uh, efficacy data could be available any day. It, it all depends on when you have a statistically significant number of SARS-CoV-2 illnesses that have occurred in the study population at day 28 or post day 28. Um, so basically what we've done is we're giving 21 people a vaccine, 21 pe pe people placebo, and wait to see if it does anything in terms of protection. Um, if all of the cases that develop are in the placebo group, then the vaccine would be 100% efficacious. If it's split 50-50, then the, the vaccine basically does nothing. Um, if a bad result would be if actually the, the illnesses come up all in the, in, in the vaccine uh, group, because that would say that now the vaccine is doing something the wrong way. Um, and we'll, we have a number of interim looks. Um, it's all about statistics. Um, part of the reason we've gone from originally 30,000 to now 44,000 is also about statistics into getting um, data. Um, and as people, I don't have my mask, but as people are wearing masks, um, it's obviously cut down on, on the spread, which then um, statistics is based on how many people get exposed. Um, and so that drives um, when we'll see cases. Um, an interesting um, side point is that we have, as I said, an RSV vaccine. RSV is, is seasonal in infants. Um, and right now, now we should be running a seasonal trial down in the, uh, in the summer. We should have been in, a, in the Southern hemisphere in the winter time. Um, but we haven't been running that study in part because with everybody wearing masks, we're not seeing the RSV rates 
that we have in the past. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see with the flu season coming up, whether everybody wearing masks affects the, you know, the flu, the transmission of flu. Um, one would expect it probably will. Um, Jody asked me to speak about some of the challenges in addition to the program. And so I, I would think, I would say that one of, you know, one of the biggest challenges for us as a vaccine company has been like every other business is just keeping things going. Um, the R&D group I work with and most of the vaccine organization is based in Pearl River, New York, which is just outside New York City. Everything was locked down. We stayed open as an essential business. Um, other Pfizer sites didn't, but we did because we were working on the vaccine. Um, and the challenge was just keeping things going while keeping employees safe. Uh, we average probably about 900 people on site pre-March. In March, we went down to under, March and April, we were under 400 people on site. And so we cut back significantly on the population there and what they could do. Um, we've started to ramp back up. We're up to probably around 600 on site in uh, September timeframe. So we're not jumping way back up quickly. We're ramping up slowly, making sure that we can keep people socially distanced, um, that they can wear masks all the time. And we've also focused and continue to focus on that virtual, this, this aspect. Um, you know, the doing it from home, working from home whenever possible, um, even for our lab based employees. So we've from told people to come in, you come in, do your lab work in the morning. And if you don't need to be in the lab in the afternoon, you go home, you do the data analysis at home, you do meetings at home, if you don't need to be on on site, um, to do actual physical lab work, then then you shouldn't be there. Um, for example, I, I'm only I'm I deal with operations, so more about running the labs from a functional standpoint, facilities, budgets, things like that. Um, I've only been on site probably a dozen times in the past six months and have only in the, in the last six months probably had two or three in-person meetings with somebody. So much like all of this. Um, specific challenges to the program itself. Um, for science, it's like Jody showed pictures of people wearing masks working in the lab. It's that doing that lab work, socially distanced, but having people to get work together. And some of our things, we have people working in a six foot biosafety cabinet for two or three hours together. And so they can't be socially distanced. There's no way they can be six feet apart. Um, and so there's minimizing that. How do we do that? Is it taking a step back and saying, do you really need, both need to be working together in the hood at the same time? Um, we have people working on doing virtual training. So instead of training somebody by side by side, do you train them by watching what they're doing using a WebEx or a Zoom or a, an iPhone and FaceTime, you know, doing things differently like that. Um, into as little time as possible and yet keeping safety at the top priority, making sure things are, are, are safe to go into people and will not be an adverse um, reaction process or problem. Um, and that's included things like, I said, manufacturing at risk. Uh, we started scaling up manufacturing in phase one for to, to think about phase three and beyond. So spending millions and millions of dollars where we would wait normally until we knew it was a, a better risk profile for going forward. Um, Things like setting up 100 clinical trial sites, um, most of which are in hospitals and clinics. And obviously with healthcare needs for infected patients, you're limiting how you're doing that. And so how you set up those hundreds of clinical um, sites um, to enroll 30,000 subjects or 44,000 subjects. We enrolled 30,000 in a month and a half. Normally we would, we would enroll that number in a 12 month plus time frame. So just getting 30,000 people in the door um, at this place, places. And then receiving hundreds of samples from those, you know, every, everybody, every sample vaccine you get, a, they get swabbed and, and a blood test. And then they come back and they get swabbed and they get a blood test and then they get a blood test. And anytime they're illness, they send it a, a swab, a self swab. So we're getting hundreds of clinical samples every day in hundreds of boxes from all of those sites, Monday through Saturday. We occasionally get a shipment on Sunday, 
and we're running assays on those Monday through Sunday. So we actually have people working over the weekends. Um, we have assay groups that now run three shifts, which is not normal for science. Um, we have groups that, where they're working, somebody comes in at six o'clock in the morning, works till noon, somebody comes in at noon and works till six, and somebody comes in at six and works till midnight um, to run the assays over the course of the day. And then the simple things like not getting toilet paper, but you know, early on toilet paper was hard to find, right? It's getting scientific supplies and um, those put in our, to send to the site to put our tubes in, uh, pipette tips, tissue culture flasks, um, and even, and especially things like the SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic tests. Those are being rationed. And so how do we, at Pfizer have what we need to continue to um, you know, move forward with the clinical trial so that the vaccine potentially can come out, yet balance that with obviously the health needs for people screening at, at hospitals. Um, and that's an interesting thing, I think, from a business standpoint, for those of you in business that, that I think um, companies, especially we, we are reevaluating the, the thought of just-in-time supplies. Um, not warehousing things in the past was, a, was an approach. Now we're looking and saying, well, if we had six months of supplies, that would be much better um, than, than, than not having those. Um, because you don't know what's gonna not be available next week sometimes. And I guess through this all, I just, I would say, you know, um, everybody thinks of big pharma as a uh, big pharma and a big company, but um, Pfizer's been extremely supportive of its employees and programs. Um, We've created new ways to do child care and help child care and adult care and extending benefits um, and doing those quickly, which is not something a big company is known for and, and, and usually moving nimbly. Um, we've done things like use the corporate jet to move vaccine or clinical samples between, you know, aviation was not really moving. Um, if we needed to get something one to Seattle, um, the, the pilots flew up, drove it, you know, drove it down to, to an airport down in New Jersey and flew it to Seattle. That's the way we could move things quicker um, from a process. Um, and so that's been, you know, that's been the development of the program. And again, I will say, you know, the, the company has, has been committed to getting a vaccine, um, spending two billion of our own money to make sure it moves forward. And I guess that's where I'll stop. Hey, for questions. Now, I think yeah. questions for, for right now, so we can hear from uh, Rushika, and then we'll open it up for some conversation and questions. I think. Thank you, Bob. So, Rushika, are you ready to tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. Can you? Um, well, I'm going to share my screen, and then let's see if this works. Can you see my slides? Okay, so uh, thank you to Jody and Goshen for having me back. Uh, it's been great uh, to see everyone. Um, I wanted to say I started my research career in Stan Grove's lab when I was a freshman and it was an amazing four years of research with him. So I owe him um, everything for my success. Um, so my lab, uh, I'm at Colorado State University. I did my PhD um, in, uh, oh, I think I have a timer on somewhere. Uh, I did my PhD at Purdue and my lab uh, right now at Colorado State focuses on uh, looking at the have infinite interactions with the organism and how drugs might alter that. So when SARS-CoV-2 hit, um, I had to jump into coronaviruses because um, uh, there was a need. Uh, primarily, the need was that we were getting um, contacted by, by lots of people uh, around the world to test their antiviral inventories. And Colorado State has a large BSL-3 facility. Uh, the, so I was able to um, convert an entire wing into a respiratory virus wing uh, and establish, um, oh my God, sorry about that. I haven't, talk, uh, I haven't turned my timer off. Uh, <laughs> Respiratory uh, virus wing that will um, so that we can screen these antivirals and the, uh, what we've been doing is screening antivirals and disinfectants and inhalants as well as natural products. 
So I started uh, doing this program um, and having uh, basically three phases to it. Um, the first was to really establish basic antiviral assays so that we could help all these uh, companies and in, uh, universities screen their inventories. And in phase two, I was really interested in doing combination therapeutics, because if you know for hepatitis C and HIV, the two main disease, viral diseases were to see if we could um, uh, establish some combinations uh, for SARS as well. And the third is uh, the third phase is where my research program really is focused, and that's identifying how viruses um, interact with uh, ho the host and um, how we can uh, interfere with those interactions for therapeutic uh, in intervention. So I'll just uh, describe the first phase. Uh, this is uh, basically we're using a SARS-CoV-2 virus strain from uh, Washington and we use African green monkey cells and human cells and we're uh, basically doing uh, cytoprotection or cytotoxicity assays um, to look at if the virus uh, and the compound together can protect the cells. Uh, so if the cells are protected, basically you have virus inhibition. Um, this is going to go, uh, this timer is going to go on forever, so I'm, I apologize. <laughs> uh, uh, and we're doing plaque assays, which is how we titer virus, uh, the amount of virus coming out. We've also established high content screening, so we can now screen hundreds of uh, antivirals. Um, and also we can look at uh, what's happening inside the cells and looking at viral genome replication. The nice thing about Colorado State is that we are a vet school, and so we have access to uh, animal models. Uh, we can put uh, three cameras in our BSL-3 facility and go all the way down to mosquitoes. Uh, for SARS, we've developed a hamster model as well as a deer mouse and bat model for um, testing not just uh, antivirals but also vaccines. So I'll show you some basic um, uh, results from some of the studies we've been doing. Uh, these are disinfectants and inhalants. So the disinfectant, this is an eye wash that we tested for a company. And uh, basically, it's you mix the virus with the eye wash, and then you put it on cells to see if, uh, how much of the virus is missing. So what you see in the red arrows uh, here is that you uh, have basically eliminated uh, the virus to detectable levels compared to the controls. And so um, this uh, eye wash has uh, contribute to testing it against SARS. And then we've also tested inhalants. Um, so this, this is basically an inhalant that has been used for TB and for lung uh, protection. And so we were able to test it just like a drug against virus. And what you see here is a virus kill curve. And you can see that it kills the virus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, kills the virus, but uh, does not harm cells. And so Basically, the idea was to um, demonstrate that this inhalant that works against TB and lung, other lung diseases works against SARS. In clinical trials. So we've also established visualization-based hydrocut assays. So that's using microscopy, and uh, we're testing a lot of natural products from the University of Kingston and in Jamaica. And what we can do is literally uh, using microscopy screen, a plate like this, that is 96 wells, uh, we can um, uh, you know, put uh, hundreds of uh, compounds on there and screen it at once, just looking at the cells and whether they're alive or dead uh, as a readout of whether the virus is succeeding or not. So these are some results from those high throughput assays. And uh, what I just wanted to show you that in blue is dead cells, in green is live cells, and in brown is the virus. So if you have more live cells and less, uh, and more live cells, less dead cells, that means that the, the, the drug is winning and the virus is inhibited. And you see that kill, virus kill curve here showing that this concentration of drug is really uh, inhibiting the virus. This is a natural product, so you're not going to get very strong data out of this because it's a mix of comp 
compounds from a leaf extract. And so when you look at pharmaceutical compounds, they are more concentrated because they're purified. So the results here are pretty mediocre, but um, the, uh, the goal is to really just screen these compounds, these leaf extracts for people so that they can use it that in um, uh, human use without having to go through um, the normal uh, FDA approval and clinical trials. So we're gonna, we're continuing to test F the approved drugs because that's the fastest to getting into, into the clinics. We're also testing investigational compounds, sRNAs, natural products, and antibodies. Uh, so in phase two, I will just uh, show you some really nice data from a triple drug combination that has now gone on to clinical trials. Uh, so the problem with single drugs is that you have to use a high dose and you also have very large um, uh, complications. Uh, some people may react to be hyperreactive or hyperreactive. Some people have idiosyncratic um, reactions, which means that they react differently. Uh, each person reacts differently to the drug. And also you have comorbidities that complicate the situation. So combination therapy is really a powerful way to uh, mitigate the virus. And so in this combination, um, there's drug A, B, and C. Uh, unfortunately, because I have signed a lot of uh, non-disclosure agreements, I can't tell you what the triple drug combination is, um, but they're drugs that you're familiar with. Um, the idea is that you mix the three drugs and the mixture together is synergistic. What that means is that drug A plus B plus C will produce a certain effect, but what we see right now is that that effect is much more enhanced. So. As a result, you have to use much less of each drug. And so this is just a, a, a idea, to give you an idea. In blue is just virus, and in orange is one drug, in yellow is two drugs, and in green is three drugs. So we have delayed virus infection by about two and a half days uh, with the triple drug combination. And what we also have shown is that we can uh, reduce virus to non-detectable levels with the triple drug combination. So this triple drug is all FDA approved drugs. They're just in combination so that they enhance each other's efficacy. And so we are really excited for the phase two clinical trials uh, to see if it really works in humans. And we hope that it does. So I'll end with uh, just the long-term goal of my laboratory as well as um, our uh, antiviral program uh, is to really understand the, the human as a whole and to understand metabolically what happens. Uh, this is really important because as you know, SARS is causing uh, multiple um, complications because if you have diabetes or obesity or metabolic syndrome. And so what we try to understand is how do drugs alter the physiology of the human and how does uh, obesity or diabetes complicate that physiology and how does it impact how the drug works. We're also interested in the microbiome uh, of the humans. The ultimate goal um, here is to really drive towards companion diagnostics and what that means is uh, you want to ident identify uh, on a personal basis uh, what works for each individual because some drugs may work for some people and not the others. So this is the long-term goal. Um, my focus is mainly metabolism, so it's a perfect uh, goal for the focus of my research lab. So this is my team. Um, I do have uh, several individuals. That, um, Brian is a colleague of mine in my department. David Patterson is the vice president for research and translation who decided to jump on uh, my team uh, because he thought there was a lot of promise in this effort. Um, these are my students who are really worked 16 hours a day for the last six months to test all these antivirals. Um, I've gotten a lot of support from the Colorado Betcher Foundation uh, and research grants, um, and also the Office of the Vice President for Research. Uh, I am the co-director of the Center for Metabolism of Infectious Disease, so that's where the future, our future goals um, were inspired by. And yeah, so I'm happy to take any questions. Now stop sharing. There we go. I, this is Sanjay Jabraj. I, again, also uh, uh, work with uh, Stan Grove, so it seems like I'm in, I'm in good company here. 
uh, I, I, do, I do have a, a question, um, and, and it goes to sort of what Bob was talking about and what Mushika is talking about. It seems like the level of uh, work that's going into the space is, is amazing. Uh, the level of collaboration, the level of transparency. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about sort of the best practices. What are, what, are, what are things like, for example, when Bob talked about acceleration of, of uh, clinical trials, uh, what kind of best practices are, 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 have we, have, are at least our companies uh, thinking of, of, of retaining? Uh, and, and in terms of, from what Rushika was talking about, you know, collaborating with industry, you know, are there any learnings, um, you know, that, that we want to keep? Uh, to keep these kind of collaborations going. I know we're under a sort of a pandemic model, but are there things that we can retain when we don't have a pandemic? Uh, so I was wondering if you can, can talk a little bit about that. Bob, do you want to take the first question? So, um, sure. So, <laughs> the point of figuring out what best practices we're going to retain. I think one of our, one of our, in the vaccine group, one of our biggest fears is that this becomes the model going forward. Um, and, and that's the challenge is that, that we have overlapped so many things because of a pandemic um, that we're running, you know, we're running, like I said, we're running seven days a week, you know, 6 a.m. to midnight. Um, you know, there are people who are very dedicated, you know, doing this. I, I think it creates challenges in terms of a normal life. Um, and that's one of the things um, we're having discussions about is, is what, when do we get back to our normal hectic pace as opposed to this hectic pace? Um, there are, you know, I think some of the best practices in terms of, you know, setting up, you know, facilities, having, having things in place. Um, you know, collaborating. I mean, I think the biggest is is the openness, um, the openness and willing to say, you know, this is where we're at. This is what we're doing. How how is it working for this group? Um, the the sharing of resources, the sharing of information, um, and and I think that's the biggest biggest plus. Now, you know, again, where where nobody in this case, you know, I don't think that from a pharmaceutical standpoint, from a vaccine perspective, anybody's expecting that this is a, um, that everybody's racing to get a product, getting some, to get something out to meet a need, um, as opposed to protecting your, your proprietary position. Um, and, and that's going to be the challenge going forward. Because in the end, um, I remind people that pharmaceuticals in the end are a business. And so we have to make money to keep, to keep uh, doing the research. you understand that you know again since, since the sequence was out there anybody and everybody can can get the sequence and there's no proprietary aspects to that um, which allow everybody to develop at speed um, without worrying about patents right and i i think um in terms of the antiviral space um we've um one of the things that happened at the beginning was there were lots of companies coming at us. And so we did have to work 16, uh, seven to uh, really be able to uh, cater to these needs. But what has now developed uh, slowly is uh, really stable interactions with a lot of these companies and also universities to uh, think about long-term interactions, not just for coronavirus, but for other viruses as well. And one of the best things that has come out of uh, my interactions with industry and academia uh, in the antiviral space is that uh, there's this one company where we did the triple drug combination for them and we literally paid for everything uh, and we did all the work, but what they produced, gave us was the knowledge of how do you do a triple drug combination that really matters to the clinic. And so that was just fantastic education for myself as well as for my students. Uh, they brought people here and we worked to, side by side to get the triple drug to the point where it can directly go into the clinic. You know. So the, I think uh, COVID has definitely changed uh, how we interact with each other uh, in terms of uh, cross-pollination between industry and academia. Um, and 
the fact that we've now set up an antivirus screening facility, it makes it available for a lot of people around the world. I didn't realize that nobody or very few places had biosafety level three facilities. And so I was shocked as to why they were all coming after us. Um, and it put a lot, a tremendous amount of pressure on us to try to produce faster and faster until actually someone who's with us today, um, uh, or was, uh, Angelo, are you here? <laughs> uh, Angelo said, uh, Rushi, uh, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So uh, you have to kind of take some time off and um, actually slow down. And I actually did that. And uh, I think it's more manageable now. So. I want to say hi to Sanji. <clears throat> <laughs> hey, Stan, it's been a while. <laughs> but I have a question for Bob. Um, I just this morning I noticed on uh, uh, email that that uh, they're having trouble getting enough people to participate in the clinical trials of the people of the uh, more susceptible groups, like elderly and uh, the uh, people of color, are are not represented uh, highly enough in in those groups and i'm wondering if if that's something you're aware of or is that a problem that some of us should step up to or what so it, it's interesting because that's one of the challenges in, in in compressing all of this is normally you know normally the phase one and the phase two and even the initial phase phase one and phase two are in healthy adults um, you know, often college students, you know, people who volunteer, we pay to get them, you know, pay, pay for, you know, pay them to come in and do this. And, and same with drug trials, any drug trial. Um, and you don't go into at risk patients. With FDA, we go into things like HIV patients. Um, you know, patients with immune, dis you know, immune disorders. That is something that we would not normally do in a, in a trial until post licensure. So we would come back after we showed um, that it is safe and effective in a healthy volunteer patient, you know, patient uh, population. And then we come back, for example, we have a, a, a pneumococcal vaccine, um, Prevnar, which we showed in infants and healthy infants and then you went into adults and it was approved and and but then going into older adults we are doing studies for that in HIV patients now and that's been on the market for 10 years so that that's one of the challenges is when when is it acceptable to go into at-risk patients with something that you haven't completely tested in a healthy patient population um, and again, in, in this kind of scenario, it's, it's, it's where it, that's all getting collapsed. Um, and, and it is a challenge because, you know, normally the people who come in and volunteer are, you know, uh, a certain stereotypical um, uh, population um, tend, to, tend to do that. Um, we try to go into populations. If you, if you do go to the website, uh, Pfizer.com and look at our COVID and it shows how many people we've enrolled, how many clinical studies. It actually shows a breakdown of um, ethnic mm -hmm. uh, enrollment. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. You know, are we getting black? Are we getting Hispanic enrollment? Um, and trying to focus where we do the studies that, that, would, that would mean that there's a bigger population there that might volunteer and might be trusting enough to say, I, I'm willing to do that. Well, just add on. My name is Jim Bear. I worked for Miles and then Bayer, so I have a little bit of familiarity with pharmaceuticals and clinical trials. Are your uh, clients, your study population, how likely are they to be exposed? I mean, in these days of wearing masks and six foot separation or more, are they likely to be exposed or do so, did you make any rules about that in terms of selection well, of the population? So um, we tended to, uh, for example, early on in setting up our clinical trials, there were um, a number in New York City, a number of sites in New York City. We've deprioritized New York City in terms of enrollment because 
from a numbers perspective, the, the incidence of, of exposure is much lower now in New, York, in New York City than if you go into some other areas of the country and in other countries. Um, and so that's one of the challenges too, because obviously when we vaccinate somebody, we don't go, okay, you're vaccinated. Well, you may be, you may be in the placebo group. Mm -hmm. We don't tell them to go out and, oh, don't worry about wearing a mask. Don't do, you know, don't social distance anymore. That's, you know, don't worry about, it. we're still telling them to follow best practices to do those things. And so as those, as those happen, you, you decrease your, the, the statistics, the likelihood that somebody's going to be exposed, which mm -hmm. is part of the reason you expand the size of the trial you mm -hmm. have to end the length of the trial. Um, I mentioned the RSV. The reason our, you know, we're not really doing our RSV tro trial in the summer, su Southern Hemisphere this, this summer, our summer, their winter, was because the numbers were way down. And, and so then that vaccine is actually a maternal vaccination where we vaccinate pregnant mothers and we look for maternal antibodies in the infants because that's their, the population that is at risk newborn. Well, at some point that maternal antibody goes away and if the RSV then comes in, you get confounding results in terms of because now you've vaccinated somebody, the kid didn't get RSV during the normal season, but then gets RSV, what role did the vaccine play in not protecting? Um, and so if there's not incidence of disease out there, it, it's then hard to get numbers. Um, you know, that's why, uh, you know, Ebola vaccine sort of like really was going fast and then you know, now it's without Ebola outbreak, it's hard to know the, the efficacy of the vaccine because you don't challenge, you don't challenge people with, with Ebola, right? Um, we could actually do an RSV challenge study. Um, and there's been talk about, not by Pfizer, but there have been some groups that have talked about whether they do a COVID vaccine challenge study where you actually take healthy adults, give them the vaccine, and then challenge them with COVID and see if they are um, come down, you know, get infected. Hmm. <laughs> your studies <laughs> yes so Bob, uh, I, have a, I have a question Rishika I had a question about antivirals oh sure sorry I don't I interrupted somebody maybe I was curious about uh, antivirals and, and resistance so if, with antivirals that are used for the flu and i'm not very familiar with these how they how quickly does resistance develop to uh, by the viruses to antivirals uh, how does that compare with antibiotic right so and what do you think that might be like with covid yeah so um Resistance will develop for sure. For coronaviruses, you don't have uh, the mutation rate is much lower, but um, resistance develops to an antiviral that directly impacts the virus. So, for instance, remdesivir is a, a nucleoside analog and it uh, directly interacts with the polymerase of the virus. And so then the virus can mute, uh, you know, mutant populations can arise that is resistant to it. But when you do a triple drug combination like the one I talked about, you're actually hitting the host uh, processes uh, with two drugs. And then one of the drugs is the third drug hits the virus. And so the chance of um, accumulating uh, resistance is far lower. And so for influenza, for instance, there was a really great triple drug that was developed. But um, I think once you develop a triple drug, uh, those three drugs come from different companies. And so it's a matter of how does the pharmaceutical industry move forward financially to develop the triple drug. So for hepatitis C and HIV, it, it is um, lucrative for the companies to uh, invest because it's a long-term disease. Uh, for COVID, I'm guessing that it will be as well. And so I'm hoping that they would uh, invest in uh, the, the triple drug combination. But that's where you need combinations because you reduce re resistance significantly. So, yeah. So I had a question for Bob, actually. Um, do you know if the uh, immune response, uh, are you triggering a long-term immune response? Are you still getting plasma blasts or are you getting T-cell responses to your vaccine? So um, 
Well, <laughs> we have limited data in the sense that we have data in, 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 from the phase one patient. So you have limited people there where at least as far as I understand right now, we're still testing, we're, you know, we're going back to those people, leading them to look at that. And so there is lasting um, neutralizing antibody. Um, and we are getting the appropriate, and I'm lacking on my immunology lately, there's, you know, the, the classic either Th1 or Th2 um, uh, antibody, um, not antibody, immune responses, one with we're getting an immune response that's consistent with what we expect would be best for an antiviral, uh, to, you know, an antiviral approach in terms of killing the virus, identifying the virus. Um, again, the challenge is, you know, normally we would do a phase one, which is really about safety and dose. It's to say that if you put in, you know, 10 micrograms versus 30 micrograms versus 100 micrograms, what's the reaction? in you know in the shot it's not about do you get a response you know you're looking at response but you want to know immunogen you want to know you know and, and you know the 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 safety data phase two is also then expanding that safety data at dose and you then start to look at that and so we would look at immune response in our phase two a year out from that to decide what candidate to go forward with so okay. we're in we're not even six months out from our first, you know, we're six months out from our first vaccination, not even six from April, right? Just into six. So even looking at those, we're only looking at a six month window. Um, and I think that will be the challenge with the phase three is that we may know preliminary efficacy end of this month into November. It's gonna be efficacy based on two month exposure. <laughs> what you don't know is how about six months? And the realistic thing is that from a vaccine perspective, we're not going to vaccinate everybody every two months, right? That's not a, that's not a practical public health vaccine, right? Um, you got to have at least thinking it, that it's a, a yearly process, once a year, you know, if you needed a, a booster every year. Um, you can do that like you do with flu. Um, but if it's uh, us every six months, you need to get a booster of the vaccine, uh, while that's great from a pharmaceutical perspective in terms of you know continuing your your product it's really not great from a public health and, and i don't know that we would be able to support that right why would you, you know how are you going to vaccinate hundreds of millions of people every six months you know, it's going to be a challenge to vaccinate hundreds of millions of people you know once over the next year and a half um let alone if you have to do it routinely uh, um flu you know, has been scaled up to be able to do that. Um, but flu, the only reason you do that is because the flu viruses mutate and change every year. And so you got to mm -hmm. change the, the vaccine. Thank you all for your good questions. I hate to um, cut off conversation, but I do want to be mindful of the time. And so I would like to thank Brianne and Rashika and Bob for um, sharing your work with us today, and we wish you well in that work. Um, if anybody needs to head back, I think Rashika's in the middle of a conference today. So if you all need to leave um, to do other things, please do. And I suppose we can keep the meeting open a little bit if people just want to chat or visit. Um, but we just are so grateful that you all took the time today to be with us. And um, yeah, best wishes, I guess. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. On. This was great. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs>